eight commerce will join after the after after my speech after my introduction <laughs> it will be very short uh, as you know uh, this is uh, this is a session that is devoted uh, to the three awardees uh, of the best doctoral dissertation in uh, Europe uh, for uh, environmental and resource uh, economics uh, I am uh, very happy and uh, very proud uh, to chair this session uh, because uh, I was uh, more than happy to have uh, to read uh, all these excellent uh, works and uh, among uh, all the applications uh, we had to choose uh, the three best ones and so here is a choice uh, and uh, uh, we will uh, we, we will uh, listen uh, to uh, the presentations of uh, these uh, uh, papers, of these uh, three papers, and uh, uh, for sure uh, we will uh, all remember uh, in the next years that uh, it was nearly the beginning of the careers of uh, young, brilliant new colleagues. So, uh, for, uh, the first, uh, for the first talk, uh, uh, we will have uh, uh, Maurizio Malpede, who uh, presents uh, a paper uh, which is at the crossroads of uh, environmental economics and development economics. And uh, this is a, a very good illustration uh, of the point uh, that uh, environmental economics uh, begins uh, to be the center of, uh, on the, on, of economics uh, in general. And uh, so, uh, Maurizio uh, will present uh, his paper uh, during uh, 35 minutes, uh, including uh, questions. It, uh, it may be difficult to uh, ask uh, questions, but please, uh, for the attendance, uh, uh, put uh, your question in uh, the conversation and uh, I'm not sure that Maurizio will be able to see the question. Um, when I presented in my session, I couldn't see the question. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, I, I will interrupt you and, uh, and ask uh, the question uh, if, uh, if, uh, the, uh, if uh, some explanations are needed at the moment. And uh, please uh, uh, don't uh, forget that this session is recorded. And so if you don't want uh, to be uh, filmed, uh, to be uh, photographed, uh, you have to turn your, uh, your camera uh, off. So, Maurizio, you are the first speaker and the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor, and thank you everybody for being here. Uh, so today I'm presenting, uh, let me share the screen first. Let me see if I'm capable of sharing. Uh, I hope you everybody, everybody uh, looks at the screen. Uh, so today I'm presenting uh, the first paper of, uh, of my PhD thesis. Basically my PhD thesis is, the, is composed of three papers. This is uh, the uh, most complete one. Um, but if you want to take a look at the, at, uh, at the other two papers, please uh, do it and uh, I'm happy to have your feedbacks and to answer your questions if you want. Today I'm just presenting the first one. And the first one, as the title says, in, the, in this paper, I'm focusing on um, uh, batteries. So what batteries have caused in the Democratic Republic of Congo? So before presenting the whole idea, I think that uh, as the title says, we are talking about batteries then cobalt, and then we're going to figure out how cobalt impacts uh, education and fertility through child labor. So there are many links to be clear, and the first thing that we, I, want, I would like to address is the link between batteries and cobalt first. Then after having established, and uh, after everybody knows uh, the link between batteries and cobalt, we're going to move through the relationship between cobalt and education and fertility in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So the first, let me see, okay. So the first link is how battery and cobalt uh, are related to each other. So uh, batteries 
nowadays are uh, lithium ion batteries. Uh, lithium ion batteries are the most efficient ones and they have been developed since late 90, uh, 1990s. However, there was a sharp increase in uh, uh, worldwide demand of lithium ion batteries since 2007. Uh, bear in mind that uh, Steve Jobs presented his very first uh, Apple phone in uh, late 2007. The first iPhone was presented in 2007. Lithium ion batteries are nowadays uh, present in all sorts of ethical devices, the devices that we use. So starting from smartphone PCs until electrical vehicles, and especially electrical bikes, so vehicles in the next future, in the next decades, are going to increase even further the demand of lithium ion batteries. So if you guys have any question, just please interrupt me or write it down, and I'm more than happy to answer you. I forgot to, to say it uh, um, before. Uh, we also have a pool of questions. Uh, that uh, we want you to uh, to answer. So now we just to come back to our to my presentation. Um, we now know that uh, uh, lithium ion batteries are really present in uh, um, everyday life, from uh, our smartphones to our electrical vehicles, PCs, and every sort of electrical devices. And approximately seventy percent of all lithium ion batteries is composed of cobalt. So cobalt, this mineral, this tiny mineral, is so essential for, the, for composing, for the development of lithium ion batteries. Lithium ion batteries, just to, uh, uh, to make you understand, have substituted, superseded the uh, old-fashioned nickel batteries. You all remember that the, uh, the old-fashioned nickel batteries, you needed to fully um, decharge them to unplug them again. This is not true for lithium ion batteries. They are really more stable, and the, one of the reasons why they are really more stable is cobalt, is the presence of cobalt. So now we know that cobalt and uh, electrical batteries are related to each other. What we miss is where cobalt is naturally abundant in, uh, in the world. This graph here, this figure, shows you that approximately 65% of all total world supply of cobalt comes from the DRC, comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Just think that the second place, second place is shared by Cuba and Russia together with 5%. So basically, you, you see the difference between how the DRC is so important in supplying cobalt with respect to any other uh, country in the world. The next figure, this one, this histogram that, uh, that I'm showing you, is even more explicative in my opinion. This shows the total estimated reserves of cobalt underground. As you can see, the DRC, again, the Democratic Republic of Congo, accounts for almost 90% of total reserves of, of cobalt. And second place comes Zambia, which is the neighboring county country of, uh, uh, of the DRC. And then uh, Cuba, Australia, Canada, Finland, and so on and so forth. So you see the really huge importance of the, uh, the DRC in supplying this uh, mineral cobalt uh, to, for the existence of lithium ion batteries. So what is instead now, it's not clear yet, and it will be, I hope, um, more in, in a while, is um, the relationship between cobalt mining in the DRC and child labor. Um, here I provided two explicative um, pictures here. Um, they are taken from different reports. They're, they were basically before the coronavirus spreading, cobalt and child labor in the DRC was in the news. There, uh, if you Google cobalt and child labor or just cobalt mining, you're going to find a lot of reports from Sky News, BBC News, CBS, Washington Post, and so on and so forth, just investigating how children are involved in this sort of really harmful activities for them. These two pictures are, are explicative not only because you see 
uh, children working on those uh, cobalt mines. But you see also the type of job that they are performing. They, uh, cobalt is um, uh, mined compared to differently from any other minerals in the DRC, is mostly mined on the surface. So compared to, um, for example, gold, diamond, which you need to go underground, underneath to get, uh, to get uh, the mineral, in the cobalt case, is mostly mined in the surface, as you can see from the pictures. And moreover, children are really needed because they wash, you see the pictures, they wash the, uh, the, uh, the cobalt, tiny cobalt matter from the dust. So using these lakes, they stay there one day long, for example, and they wash the, uh, the cobalt, cobalt matters from the dust. So these two reasons are among the reasons why parents are more prone to send their children to work as cobalt miners relatively to any other mines. In this paper, in my paper, I then compare, as Urbastra checks, children living close to cobalt mines against any other mines, and not only on children living close or a little bit far, farther from a cobalt mine. Uh, we're gonna see it in uh, more in detail later on. So this now, I hope that the, 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 the picture of how batteries translate to cobalt in the DRC and then cobalt translates probably in, the, in child labor in the same country is more clear. Now, what e economics has done uh, in analyzing child labor issue, the effects of child labor in uh, uh, the impact of child labor in economics. So basically the literature is huge and I, um, tr I try to reframe uh, the um, literature in two different impacts, short-term impacts and medium-long-term medium -long impacts. So basically child labor has a, probably a positive um, generates an initial greater income for those families who subtract their children from school to send them to, uh, to, to work as minors. The reason is because the, basically the, um, the investment cost for, the, for those families drops because these children, as soon as they drop from school and they go to work, they uh, they receive some sort of income. So initially, you might have a boost in your income, and also, as a paper uh, shown by um, Dopke and Sidi in 2005, it's a theoretical, this paper is a theoretical paper, they show that uh, basically, um, children, uh, families, sorry, families who live in areas where child labor is present and uh, um, is uh, uh, laws are less restrictive, they face lower opportunity cost of having more children. So in those areas where uh, child labor is not an issue, is perfectly or most perfectly legal, child, uh, this, those families might have more uh, children. So the fertility rates of those families might be higher. While on the medium long term, impacts are basically all negative. Those children who drop out from school to, go, to work as cobalt miners uh, uh, or as miners, they reduce, they have a reduced cognitive development, have more health issues, and also worse wealth when compared to their peers who did not work. Uh, during their childhood. Um, because when they enter in the job market and they have dropped out early from school, they might face wealth issues. So we see that the economics literature has broadly um, uh, dealt with child labor in, in economics. What instead this uh, um, economic literature has not dealt, so basically is a harmful type of child labor. So basically the whole economic literature has dealt with child labor in forms of farming and helping parents and households activities um, into the uh, education. So basically uh, 
um, helping uh, their fathers and uh, farming activities mainly involve 16 to, from 8 to 16 hours per week. So I say it, I say it better, um, those children in the DRC and in other not developed, developed countries in the world um, who help their fathers and in managing their business or in their farming activities or household activities, they are mainly involved in those kinds of activities from 8 to 16 hours per week. This means that uh, it's still possible to have some sort of um, education in the meanwhile. There was instead a UNICEF report, a recent UNICEF report in 2017, investigating cobalt uh, miners, little cobalt miners, and they interviewed more than 1,000 children working as cobalt miners, and they asked how many hours they were uh, involved in performing those activities, and they answered typically the average working hours per week were 31. 31. So basically, this makes incompatible any sort of education. With them. So basically, those guys working as cobalt miners, they drop out from school. So we expect here an even greater um, uh, effects of uh, cobalt mining in dropping education for those children. So the goal of this paper is to answer the question whether the coal mining boom, which happened, we know, after 2007, and we're going to see it in a graph uh, just the next slide, if the coal mining boom has fostered child labor in the DRC, what are the effects in the short, in the, in, in the, in the long term, both on education and also on fertility? So we wanted to see empirically if uh, uh, basically those families living in cobalt mining areas, in, uh, in, in uh, cobalt areas, are more prone to have more children. Rather than investing on their education just to send them to work as cobalt miners as soon as they, they, they turn six or seven years old. So uh, here are the contributions of the paper. Um, as we say, this paper focuses on uh, type of child labor that has never uh, been the focus of economic literature, which is harmful uh, style of um, uh, child labor activity as defined by the International Labor Organization, the ILO. And also quantifies the um, relationship between child labor and fertility, which was firstly hypothesized, uh, and this paper wants to find a empirical relationship Okay, here, uh, just to see, this, this is a visual representation of the cobalt production uh, in the DRC. So as you can see from 2001 until 2007, basically the cobalt production was pretty constant from 20 to 25 metric tons per year. After 2007, from 2007 to, to 2010, basically in those three years, the cobalt production dropped more than triple. So it went from 20 metric tons in 2007 until more than 60 metric tons in, 20, in 2010. So you see, pre and post 2007, the um, production in, uh, of cobalt in the DRC surged more than tripled. So the, the question of the paper is basically just analyzing this, this picture, asking ourselves, what, what are the impacts? of this surge in cobalt, in cobalt production in, uh, on education and on fertility. What are the impact, the socioeconomic impacts of this mineral surge? So here, just uh, uh, very briefly on data and some descriptive statistics. Um, so I use two sets of data, one for cobalt, the other one for our outcome, for our dependent value. Cobalt data are basically uh, location of cobalt mines. So from, I'm able to use, I was able to use US Geological, geological Survey um, to locate all cobalt mines from uh, for uh, in, in the DRC. And those data are so beautiful in my opinion because you also have 
uh, not only the production, but also know whether the, the mine is artisanal or high scale common mine. So that later on, you're going to see in our robustness check, I also see whether the effects is entirely driven by um, artisanal cobalt mines, where you, you, may, you might imagine there is no regulation whatsoever, uh, rather than uh, high scale cobalt mines, where basically some regulation might, might exist. Also, I'm using cobalt production and cobalt price also for uh, checks um, uh, from the British Geological Survey. Uh, we have the history of cobalt price. But anyway, those data are easily retrievable. And then uh, the most interesting data for education, individual education attainment and fertility data. Uh, so we have, I used the demographic health surveys, the DHS, DHS are greatly used in development economics, and uh, uh, these are individuals. So basically, and they are geo-recorded with GPS. So basically, they ask a set of questions, a lot of questions. For each individual they survey, they record their GPS, they ask whether they were, where they were born, when they were born, and a lot of other questions. And I use two sets, uh, uh, two waves of this DHS, which are available online. Um, one was taken in 2007. The other one was taken in 2014. In total, more than 40,000 individuals in the, DR, in the DRC were interviewed, were surveyed, um, and were born between 1960 and 1990. So those are the data that I'm using. Then what I'm doing here is just interacting uh, the GPS of all individuals surveyed with the GPS of all cobalt mines and all mines in the DRC. So that I'm able to find the distance from each individual surveyed with each uh, mine in the DRC. Here, so the empirical strategy, um, in the empirical strategy, I compare the education attainment of those individuals who at the time of the cobalt boom, so in 2007, they were between 16, six, sorry, between six and 14 years old. So they were child at the moment. Why between six and 14? For two reasons. The first one is because of the definition of the ILO, the International Labor Organization, they define child labor Whoever uh, individual uh, is working uh, in an age between six and 14 years old. And uh, the second reason is because in the report of the DHS, 87% um, of all young adults who turn 15 years old, they um, stated that they already completed their education. So basically, we're going to see also in the descriptive statistics, they, they do not study many years as, as we, might, we might think. So in this empirical strategy, I compare uh, those individuals who at the time of the cobalt boom were children and they were living more or less close to, the, to uh, a cobalt deposit. Now, you know why this more or less close will be, will be clear. Same way for, for fertility rate. Here, just descriptives, uh, I'm gonna be very fast on this. You see that the, uh, the average education rate in the DRC is the highest here of education is almost four years on average. So they study only four years. They don't even complete their primary education on average. You see some control variable, we're gonna discuss it later. And those are for all the individuals born from 1960 to 1999. No, now this picture will be even, uh, in my opinion, even clearer. So you have a lot of dots here. The blue dots that you see are the DHS villages or so-called clusters. The DHS villages are, bear in mind that those are not individuals, but are the villages in which the survey takes place. So in each dot, you might have a few hundred people interviewed in the uh, in the DHS in the DHS poll, um, the 
the yellow dots instead are basically represented uh, represent the uh, location of all other mines in the DRC. So from gold mines to diamond to copper is also uh, really present in the DRC. Um, and there are basically all the yellow ones. While the red dots are represented, they represent the, um, the cobalt mines, the location of all cobalt mines. So as you can see, they are all located in the southern part, uh, along with um, along through the border with Zambia. You see, um, and then the red buffer. You see two red buffers. The dark red buffer is basically showing the area. 10 kilometers around a cobalt mining, uh, a cobalt mining uh, deposit. While the light green shows the area within 100 kilometers uh, away from a cobalt mine. This here is a zoom of all of the previous, uh, uh, the previous uh, figure, and the buffer, the two buffered zones are better defined. You see, every individual that at the time of the cobalt boom was children, was a child basically, um, and he was within 10 kilometers from a cobalt mine was considered as a control, as a treatment group. While the, uh, the control group is then composed of all the other individuals, of all their peers, who at the time of their co of the cobalt mine, of the cobalt boom, were children and were living just outside 10 kilometers away from the cobalt, uh, from the cobalt uh, uh, deposit. So this is for the baseline strategy. Let me remark that in the robustness checks, then I question those 10 kilometer cutoff, and then employ a special lag model, and then also a cohort analysis uh, to, uh, to, to better uh, make robust more of us, uh, sorry, to make results more of us. So basically, this is the graphical representation of treatment and control group. And here is, uh, uh, so here I have one, probably one question. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, okay, no, it was only the 12 minutes. Sorry, uh, not, not an expert. Yes, so to this, this picture, this um, slide shows you basically in numbers, what do we just say? So it's a basically a different, different uh, um, uh, strategy, while here the treatment is represented by a combination interaction between the post-1993 year of birth and the distance to a cobalt mine. Why post-1993? Post because if an individual I was born after 1993, this means that in 2007, when the boom of cobalt started, he was at most 14 years old. So he could have been treated. He was a child. If he was born before 1993, then he, was, uh, uh, he could not be treated. He had already completed the education. Also, this post variable should be, it will be then uh, uh, changed in the robustness when I implemented the cohort analysis. But anyway, we're gonna see it later. And the cobalt mine is actually an indicator variable showing if uh, individual I was living within 10 kilometers away from a cobalt mine or beyond 10 kilometers and within 100 kilometers away from a cobalt mine. Our dependent variable is either completed years of education or fertility rates. I'm going to see. And uh, some individual specific controls, as a specific controls I'm using, um, I'm controlling for the gender of the individual. This affects greatly the education. If you're female or male in the DRC, it makes a lot of difference. If you live in a urban or rural areas, and uh, other individual specific controls. Other than district linear trend, birth year fixed effects, and survey year fixed effects, because I, um, as I said before, I, I use two sets of survey, uh, the one in 2007 and the other one in 2014. So, do you, do you want me to open the question? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. 
yeah so you might thanks paul um so here here i i i provided here one question um which is basically what are the short-term and the long-term consequences on the wealth of individuals growing up in cobalt rich areas compared to their peers living just outside uh, 10 100 kilometers from a cobalt mine so from the literature what we should expect this is uh, on on the web both in the short term and in the long term how wealth is affected by by a uh, common mind so you have i guess uh, uh, no there's no time uh, to to, uh, to to answer and then after that we're gonna we're going to see uh, thanks for participating and so okay before showing the results here uh, just since we are talking about difference in difference estimation, what we want to be ensured is that there is no existing pre-existing trend in, uh, in the treatment and the control groups. So in other words, what we expect is that there should be no relationship between the distance to a cobalt mine and education prior to 2007. And the relationship between the distance and education should be only visible after 2007. So to answer this question, it turns out that I was really lucky. I was not that lucky for many other things, but on this thing I was really lucky because we say I had two uh, sets of um, uh, DHS waves. One was taken in 2007, so just before the onset of the boom. So, and the other one on 2014. So those individuals who were surveyed in 2007, those children who were surveyed in 2007, were not treated. So what we expect is that uh, there should be no visible relationship between the distance to a cobalt mine and the, the education of those children surveyed in 2007, while on those children surveyed in 2014, there should be, there should be a, a result, a difference. And this slide here shows exactly what we are saying. So this is the effects, the relationship between living within 10 kilometers from a cobalt deposit and the current year of, the, of education of those children surveyed. As you can see, for all children surveyed in 2007, there was no statistical relationship. After that, there was a statistical relationship. So just bear in mind that those are not results those actually point out that there was no confounding factors happening or curing before the onset of cobalt, of cobalt uh, boom prior to 2007. Same thing for fertility. You see on the left, in 2007, there was no, no statistical significance in the relationship between fertility rates and distance to cobalt mines. Uh, while on 2014, all women surveyed in 2014, it appears a positive and statistical significant uh, relationship. So this means, in other words, um, women are basically more uh, fertile and they have more children um, if they are close, if they live close to cobalt mine deposit. Let's say this uh, very, very fast on the results. Uh, so we have uh, the first set of results on education. We expected that, that the education uh, would decrease after for those children, um, for those individuals who at the time of the cobalt boom were children and they were living within 10 kilometers from a cobalt deposit. And column three of this uh, uh, of this table, basically column one, two, and three, they they add uh, more control and more fixed effects. Column three is the preferred uh, specification, and it points it points out uh, that um, basically 0 0.5 years of education were lost um, after 2007 from those children who were, who were uh, living close to cobalt mining uh, areas. So 0 0.5 years of education lost might seem uh, not a big deal. Instead, are a lot. Re the, the, um, the estimates are much higher than the previous literature. And just think that uh, 
the average um, education for, for a child uh, in the DRC is four years. So this is one eighth of average total completed years of education. Uh, this results instead shows fertility. Fertility, uh, you see that again, the third column and the sixth column are the preferred specification. I use two sets of, um, two definitions of fertility. The first is a five year fertility rate. This means that the total number of children born per each woman in five years prior to the interview. And the third three year fertility rate is the total number of children ever born. So I'm also considering stillbirth because I, I want to capture the intention to have children, not the actual uh, the actual effects of having, of having a child. Uh, so three year fertility rate and five year fertility rate, they both show statistical and statistically significant and positive effects of being close to a common one. So this actually show, um, shows, um, demonstrates that uh, women living close to co in cobalt mining areas, they are more prone to have children compared to their peers living just outside cobalt mining areas. So here, very fast on the robustness. Um, ah, okay. Before the robustness, I have some results. So 83% um, of people have it, uh, have it uh, done it, uh, uh, have guessed the results correct. So basically wealth increases in the short term, but declines in the long term. Um, in, in my paper, I'm able to assess uh, a, a boost in the wealth in the very short term, in the immediate. So basically those children who were sent by their parents to work as cobalt mines, um, they had a, a positive income shock, but later in their in their um, uh, after seven years, this boost completely disappears. So also my estimates are uh, going through the uh, direction that you have voted. So just to conclude here, uh, since I have one minute left, um, robustness. Uh, in the robustness, I was not able to, 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 to address all of your possible questions, but in the uh, um, and concerns, in the robustness, I'm addressing some concerns. Here, there's a list. So I'm employing a cohort analysis instead of showing, um, comparing those children, those individuals born before and after 1993. Here, I'm using a cohort analysis. So I'm comparing different years of, of birth. I'm also employing a special leg -like model to test whether the 10 kilometer cutoff is basically uh, valid or, uh, or, or not. Then I'm also testing, comparing cobalt miners against uh, any, other, um, uh, any other children working in other mines, if it is an effect of mines in general, or is just an effect with cobalt. And then also, as I, as, as I mentioned, artisanal versus ice cave cobalt mining, I'm checking for endogenous migration. I'm having a placebo test on the neighboring country, which is Zambia, and then also another check on primary versus secondary education. We expect the, the results, the effects to be only on primary and not on secondary. This is something that is done on the paper. And the conclusions we, we, we know, um, we, we have addressed them. Uh, the education rates declined by 0 0.5 years on average, and the child labor is also associated to higher fertility rates in the DRC. And that's it. That's, uh, thank you. If you want to have a look at this presentation and uh, also the complete paper, you find this um, uh, the websites where you can go. Thank, thank you, Maurizio. Uh, we didn't have uh, any questions during the presentation. Is there at least uh, one question now? Yes, Lutz? Hi, thank you, Maurizio. Um, I have a question about gender. Do you know if these kind of working in the mines is 
equally possible for boys and girls because you could think about testing if that influences the fertility decisions on gender and if boys or girls go to school differentially? So uh, thanks Lutz for the question. Very interesting indeed I checked. So the first thing that I wanted to address is, so we know that being male or female in the DRC is, uh, makes a difference in, in the completed years of education. But what I did not know uh, was whether female or men, uh, so girls or, or boys, are more prone to, to be sent to cobalt mines. When I run the analysis only looking at men and female, uh, no statistical difference was reported. And then, so I was kind of not expecting those results. I expected more uh, men to be involved in this kind of harmful activities. But then I found the explanation of, of this on the reports. So on the, on the reports that you see on online, on Google, YouTube, whatever, you see that uh, for those activities, just washing, washing the, cobalt, the cobalt matters, a lot of girls and with their moms were present. Of course, I do not have the data available since it's a legal activities. I, I do not have the data just to show but I have uh, these reports uh, just to point out that this, uh, these results, uh, confirming what, what, I, what I see uh, as a lack of difference between men and, uh, and boys and girls. Thank you, Maurizio. There is another question, and it will be the last one by Angelica. Um, hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, uh, since this boom started in 2007, and also the interview was in 2007, if your estimates might actually be underestimates, because uh, maybe there's rumors about mines coming up, and so uh, parents don't send their children to school or don't uh, even anticipate doing so. So yeah, thanks for the question. I also checked this, uh, this was uh, potentially an issue. Uh, for two reasons, this, this is not the case. Uh, the first one is that, um, so basically the cobalt revolution, let's call it like this, the, the cobalt surge was highly unexpected in the DRC. So the DRC did not expect uh, lithium ion um, batteries to, uh, to, 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 to surge and the demand of lithium ion batteries uh, uh, greatly comes um, from, from the developed and advanced work. And this is the first reason. So they did not fully expect that. The second reason why we are in the safe side um, is because the, actually the wave come out in 2007, but it was, um, it was the surveys were performed in 2006, so one year in advance. So, um, and um, in those, basically in those areas, those areas, the cobalt mining areas were also devoted to copper. Uh, and in copper, children are not mainly involved uh, as, as uh, to, in their child labor activities. They started to be involved once uh, cobalt was, uh, was clearly uh, uh, a really va valuable mineral. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you to uh, all of you. Uh, now we will uh, turn uh, to uh, Paul Netzhoff's uh, presentation. This time, a very different paper, but uh, um, but a paper also with uh, some uh, empirical uh, uh, elements uh, uh, about uh, the, uh, the economics uh, of uh, uh, renewable energies. Uh, so uh, Paul uh, will have also a survey at some time, at some time and so uh, be prepared, uh, all of you, to answer the survey. And uh, you may ask a question uh, either during the presentation or after. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mirel, um, for introducing the paper. In fact, it's very theoretical and only like there's only like small empirical parts, but we will, we will come to them. 
Um, also, yeah, thanks everyone for attending. Welcome from Berlin, um, where we wanted to meet all physically originally, which unfortunately didn't work out, but I'm really happy that um, we can do this now um, virtually online. And yeah, thanks also to the ERI and to the committee for awarding my thesis. I'm really, really happy about it. And yeah, my thesis is um, on the economics of power system transitions, but today I want to present one particular paper from it. Um, it's joint work with Jasper Meyer, and it's on, their, um, on renewable energy policies and federal government systems, and it's currently under review. Um, but yeah, as this award is awarded, not just for one paper, but for the whole thesis, I decided to give you like a really brief overview also on the other chapters or papers in my thesis. So maybe there's other papers that you like even more and um, we can talk about them afterwards or you can contact me and I can send them to you. So I would be really happy to start the discussion there also. So I just going to start with that. So my thesis um, was made up of four papers and um, the first one is I call it how to go green. It's on the effects of power system flexibility on the efficient transition to renewable generation. It's currently submitted to a journal and there I ask what the optimal paths to renewables are when conventional power generation capacities are rigid and limited in their flexibility. And it's also a theoretical work um, based on a stochastic partial equilibrium model with limited foresight. And the main result is that inflexible plants like nuclear or coal can hamper early renewable deployment, but later this deployment is accelerated if there's a lot of um, unflexible plants. Um, the second or like the third chapter because there's also an introduction, but as uh, the paper Electricity Storage and Transmission Complements or Substitutes, it's published in Energy Economics. Um, and here, as the title says, we are looking at the interdependence of storage and transmission capacities, um, also in the electricity context, of course, and the heart of the paper is a calibrated analytical two-node power system model and the main result is that um, transmission and storage capacities can be substitutes or complements, and that depends on storage location, congestion characteristic, and also the regional cost alignment. So we will see uh, much more about the first chapter, so I skip this here, um, but the last one, um, yeah, it's called Modeling Coordination Between Renewables and Grid, policies to mitigate distribution grid constraints using residential PV battery systems and it's published in energy policy. And here it's basically about presumed households and how they can be incentivized to operate their PV generation and storage that they also have a system beneficially. And this is a numerical model that we use, a multi-level uh, load flow model. And here we show that simple regulations can be quite effective already in mitigating um, grid stress in the distribution grids that arise from presumage. So now, yeah, let me come to the main paper I want to tell you about today. So the renewable energy policies and federal government systems. And as economists, we know that we could decarbonize quite efficiently using a price on carbon. But we've also seen that effective carbon pricing can be quite hard to obtain. And instead, the supporting the deployment of renewable energies is one alternative. And in fact, this is actually the instrument that we most commonly see in the real world at the moment to decarbonize power sectors, but those, yeah, also the whole society. And yeah, it was shown already theoretically that this renewable support can pretty closely approximate the social optimum. But on the other hand, these policies are often implemented in multi-level governance systems like federations as in Germany, US, or it's, if you look at Europe as a whole. And as a result, there's like increasing complexity because these policies can overlap or like different government levels, they have opposing objectives for, 
focusing on national welfare or regional development. So everything is not so simple. And then furthermore, there are some recent shifts in renewable support schemes from earlier, mostly price-based um, instruments to no quantity instruments like auctions um, to, yeah, to support renewable energies. And yeah, this, these things um, lead me to the research question that we're posing in this paper, and this is how the instrument choice of the upper level government, so whether it's a price or a quantity instrument, affect the incentives for lower level governments to implement their own renewable support schemes. And of course, what we then want to know also is whether the combined support from the government levels is efficient. Yeah, this research contributes to different strands of literature. Uh, firstly, there's one of public goods provision um, and in federal systems. And here we study incentivizing public goods provision through policies instead of direct provision that we've seen before. And furthermore, we add to the literature on pollution control in federal systems. And here we extend the scope of this literature to include public goods instead of focusing just on public bads, which was, yeah, which is the usual way so far to do it. And also we, of course, contribute to the recent literature on renewable energy support, um, which has so far mostly ignored these uh, multi-level considerations. Finally, there is some literature also on um, multi-level policies, mostly um, with overlapping renewable energy and climate policies. And here we are the first ones to focus on yeah, renewable energies and then put also into focus the policy differentiation on the federal level. So what are we doing exactly? Um, we are basically extending Williams' model on pollution regulation um, and allow it to analyze also the um, policy support of public, public goods like renewables. Um, Williams' model was um, basically made for public bads. And um, yeah, to this end, we model a federation with end states and respectively then one federal government and, and state governments. And in each state, there exists a competitive and representative supply of renewable capacity. And concerning the policies, we assume that the federal government supports the deployment of renewables by either a price or quantity instrument, as mentioned before. And there we consider the feed-in tariff as the price instrument, um, and then, so basically the feed-in tariff is paid per unit of capacity, renewable capacity deployed, or um, for the quantity instrument, we consider a quota. So a quota is set, um, and then the um, support is based on the quota price that arises. And these instruments can be state-specific or nationwide, so that's why this I here is in parenthesis. In this talk, yeah, we'll focus um, most, or, yeah, we'll only focus on the nationwide um, policies because they are also more interesting. And yeah, for the on the state level, uh, each government incentivizes the renewable deployment by state subsidy (SI), which is also paid per unit of renewable capacity. And yeah, while we basically model all these policy supports as direct payments, so direct payment for the capacity, um, they can also be understood as some financial equivalent. So let's say there's like a renewable beneficial um, um, area designation in a state or infrastructure is provided. So and then given the support from both government levels, like the, um, the federation and the states, the suppliers decide on how much renewables um, to deploy um, per state, so RI, and we denote the total renewable capacity, nationwide renewable capacity within capital R. 
And yeah, now there's one last thing that basically completes our model. And that is that the cost that the, um, like the cost from the federal policy might be unevenly distributed among states. So as a consequence, each state might incur a different burden share um, from financing the to finance the federal policy. And we denote this by EI. And we assume that these burden shares are exogenous. So of course, then they are not a decision variable of either of our players here. And this is, for instance, the case if um, the, and the burden, uh, like the, the policy is refinanced by a levy on electricity consumption or maybe just on the central budget and then you, you don't really interfere with the central budget just to, to, to do this. Um, but this is also an assumption that could be relaxed later. Yeah, and finally it remains to look at the game structure. So we consider that all governments decide simultaneously on their support, so they play in an Ash game and then subsequently um, the renewable providers, given the policy support they might, they want, they could um, get, um, they decide on how much capacity to deploy. So they are then the Stuckelberg followers in this, in this setting. Concerning our cost and benefit assumptions, we consider that the states are asymmetric in their cost and benefits of renewable deployment. And the costs are purely local and follow a convex function with constant second derivatives. And the benefits are concave with respect to the local as well as the global um, or like the nationwide renewable capacity. And like these local benefits, they may comprise revenues for generating power or some economic activity or local environmental improvements. While national benefits, they may comprise contribution to a climate target or in general, decreasing electricity generation cost. And yeah, due to this distinction between uh, local and nationwide benefits, um, the renewable deployment is an impure public good um, in the perspective of the, of the states. And yeah, finally, we assume that the state's marginal benefit from renewable deployment is decreasing in national capacity. And this is, or this could, for instance, be to, to use some kind of merit order effect, which means that um, the more renewables there are in the whole nation, the less benefit I just have if I put some more in my own state. Um, yeah, now as I've I, I basically completed showing you the model and now I want to ask you whether you, let's see, I have prepared some poll here and I wanted to see whether you have an intuition now on the results. So, I would like to ask you our own research question. Um, so how does now this, um, the policy choice from the upper level government, whether price or quantity can affect the incentives for the lower level governments to support renewables? Um, yeah, you can think about it a bit. I think I, I keep this open and I would just continue with the presentation. I hope that works. Um, and I see how results are coming in. So, okay, let's, let's go on and um, I, I will hopefully uh, tell you then what the outcome is. You might, we might be able to even improve your intuition on the model a bit more. Um, so first I want to show you the case with overlapping support um, where we have a price instrument from the federal government, the feed-in tariff, and then, of course, the subsidies from the states. And here we have the formal decision problem, um, just really shortly. So the, the federal government chooses the feed-in tariff T to maximize the net benefits of or total welfare of renewable deployment, and then the state uh, government also chooses like 
its policy to maximize the state's net benefits. And in addition to like, these local costs and benefits, um, they also consider this um, burden share. Um, so basically how much they have to contribute in financing the federal policy, but also the parts that they receive from the federal budget. So um, yeah, it's a quite an interesting objective here. And of course, this is all subject to the profit maximization of the renewable um, suppliers with, who consider also like these costs and then the benefit that they can get for um, providing renewables. Yeah, what, is, uh, what, are, what are all the results on the um, national equilibrium? So here the I have to do to time reasons skip the the way to it, but um, we find that um, the feed in tariff the height of the feed in tariff is chosen such that it amounts for all for the sum of all marginal national benefits, and the uh, state subsidy actually amounts for um, the marginal benefits from local and the marginal benefits from global deployment, but it, it also um, in, involves here the marginal burden share of the state. And what we see is that states with a relatively high burden share, they will choose a lower subsidy because of the negative sign here, of course, while states with a high, with a low burden, they would choose a higher subsidy. And here the intuition is that by decreasing their subsidy, these states that have a high burden they can actually reduce the overall renewable deployment a, a bit and thus also reduce their burden so they're incentivized to do this so then when we look at the combined support of the two so um, feed and tariff plus subsidy when is this efficient so um yeah we can establish proposition one here and um Basically, what it adds to what I've just said before is that the combined support is too low in state I. If the state's burden share exceeds, so it's too low, if it exceeds its share of marginal benefits from nationwide deployment and vice versa. And here, Psi I is the optimal level of combined support. Yeah. We can also talk about this later. And now what changes if we look uh, at the quota? So the formal problem looks quite similar. So I've indicated all the changes in red. So of course now we choose um, the quota level instead of the feed and tariff. Um, and now the, you know, we have the quota price in here instead of the direct feed and um, um, instead of the height of the feed and tariff. And crucially also here, we consider that this quota price is unbound so that um, all quotas that are given out are also realized as capacity. Um, but yeah, in general, I think it doesn't look too different. So, but let's look at the results and whether they change. So this is what we wanted to know, right? And um, here we see again that the um, efficient quota price, or, or like the quota is chosen that such that the quota price um, includes the sum of all marginal benefits from nationwide deployment. So basically, this is exactly the same as under the feed and tariff. Um, but um, the states subsidy is also again determined by the marginal um, benefit from local deployment, but now also from this, let's say, merit order term, like the second um, cross derivative here. And as you, if you remember, we defined this to be negative due to these kind of merit order effects that can arise. And then we see that here, because there's also a negative sign, um, a state um, with a high burden will actually, so with a high burden share E, will actually choose a higher subsidy. And um, yeah, this is different to what we've seen before. And here the intuition is that 
due to the quota, the total amount of renewable capacities is fixed. But by increasing the support in the state, if you're high burdened, you can actually drive down the quota price a, a bit and therefore reduce your overall burden. So, yeah, let's, let's compare this again. Um, so if we look at the quota and also see how the um, combined support works out. So here the combined support um, through auction and subsidy in a state is inefficiently high if the relative burden share, so EI, um, is inefficiently high if the burden share is larger than the actual capacity share in the state. And this is basically opposite to what we've seen before in the feed and sheriff, where the state decreases its subsidy in response to an increase in its burden, while under a quarter, the state increases the subsidy in response to an increase in its burden. So if we say we change just these um, EI parameter, um, the states will decide in different directions depending on the uh, federal policy decision. Yeah, so we have some opposing effects here. Now, so far for the theory, um, we try to translate this at least like a bit in the real world. So applying this for um, German onshore, onshore wind deployment. And actually it's like, it's been shown that the German states or Bundesländer have played quite an active role in the energy transition. And as I explained before, we, had, we have seen this um, switch from feed and tariffs to discriminatory price auctions around 2017. And now, um, on also in Germany, the federal policy is financed by like a levy or surcharge on the electricity price. So it's um, totally fine to assume this uh, burden share as exogenous. And yeah, what we do of, is then we approximate this burden share by um, using state-specific power demain, demand data, and we um, approximate the uh, renewable capacity basically with the um, capacity available for generation. So we use state-specific capacities, but also state-specific full load powers to, uh, to account for like um, different yeah, availabilities of renewables, like in the generation of renewables. And this is what we find. So basically, we, we then can deduct what the incentive change for different states is from the policy um, shift. And we see that um, yeah, states with a relatively high capacity and a relatively low electricity demand, they have an incentive to decrease their subsidies, while states with a relatively high demand, so usually the large, large states, and with so far low capacity shares, they have an incentive to increase it. And um, this table is actually sorted roughly north to south. Um, and here we see that, in fact, the, the states with like a high wind yield in the north who have already large capacities, they are incentivized to decrease their support for renewables, while the states in the south, they would now be incentivized to increase it. And actually, there's some also empiric evidence that supports our model here. So we have seen that in Schleswig-Holstein, which is the first um, row here, there's been a moratorium on new wind capacity. So basically nothing is built there anymore, even though they have like a really high share in the moment. And also the Varia on the other end of the spectrum, they have announced at least a couple of months ago that they want now to support renewables more. But I mean, there's also some evidence um, in the in the counter direction, so yeah, it's not at all clear. Yeah, coming to the discussion, like as always in theoretical models, there's a lot of assumptions that I would like to make transparent at least. So we have this Nash game between governments, which you could dispute, I guess. So 
this is re a reasonable assumption when all governments can adjust equally well. And yeah, we have this exogenous distribution of the burden share. So here we could imagine that the um, results would look quite different if we endogenize this, but at least for the case of Germany, this is also like a reasonable assumption. Um, yeah, looking at the empirical analysis, um, we're basically in particular far away from the real institutional setting that we have. So one major point is here that we assume that all the capacities will be realized and this is not really what we have seen empirically in the last two years in Germany. Even, the, even though they um, give out quotas, there's a price cap on them and then not all capacities might be realized. Um, yeah, and there's probably also a lot of other assumptions that we can um, address in the Q&A. Coming to the conclusion, so um, I've shown you that the incentives for state subsidies depend on the federal instrument choice. So whether the federal government decides to support renewables via price or quantity instrument, but also on this burden share, which we kept exogenous. Um, and the main takeaway for you here from this talk is that a high state burden to finance the federal policy incentivizes lower state subsidies on the price and higher state subsidies on the quantity instruments. So basically we see um, like these um, exactly opposing results. And I just wanted to add that, of course, um, compared to the original Weizmann price versus quantity, there's no uncertainty involved here. So this um, really just comes from the two-level structure. Um, yeah, on the empirical side, we've seen that, um, yeah, I, I've shown you um, what our model would predict for Germany. And if you're a bit more into the electricity sector in Germany, it might be interesting that the, so the, the switch that we see from feed and tariff to quotas might lead to a reduction of transmission stress in Germany because so far we have like a lot of generation in the north while demand is rather in the south. And so now if we shift our renewable generation a bit more to the south, then this would mitigate transmission stress. And what I would also find quite interesting is to yeah, check or like, I mean, the model is quite general. So we, we called it um, renewable support, but it could also be something else. So, I mean, you have seen the cost and benefit function and say, and like the two level structure, and this might also apply to many other um, goods, um, like maybe transportation or communication infrastructure. Um, this is also something that I might want to address in future work, so maybe we can generalize this all like a bit more and then um, I guess this could also make a nice paper. And on the theory side, um, we could consider different policy mixes and I know that some colleagues are also working on this and we could of course discuss the decision sequence or also add uncertainty even to the two level structure and see how this changes the picture. And if we want to keep on working on, an, on the empirical analysis, which would also be interesting, I think, I mean, so what we've done there so far is really rough. So really just like a complement to our theory, but it would also be nice to look into this a bit deeper. So now um, we're coming back to the fun part. I, I'm probably a bit over time, but I just show you the results and we can, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know, Miguel just shaked her head or? It's okay. It's okay, so okay. So I, we, have, we still have time for the fun part. So um, it wasn't, so actually nobody said that the different policies wouldn't wouldn't have any effect so i guess if they wouldn't have um it would be really hard to get a paper paper published out of this and maybe also to to win an award for this so um, most of you were actually right and i added here 
that it affects the equilibrium outcome depending on this exogenous burden that, that we had in our model, which is crucial. And of course, I wanted to say that this fourth answer here is also totally fine. So um, if you've chosen either of those two, you were absolutely right. This um, yeah, finalizes my talk. And I thank you very much. I've, I've thanked you already in the beginning. Um, if you're interested in this um, or also in one of the other papers, um, I'm really happy if you contact me and um, we can start a discussion then or even uh, now if there's some question on the paper. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Paul, for your presentation. And I also take the opportunity to thank you uh, because you are one of the organizers of uh, this uh, conference and uh, you were very active uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to put this uh, in, in order. So, uh, do we have uh, any questions from the other speakers or from the audience? Uh, I don't see any hands raised. Lutz, Lutz has raised his hands. Lutz? His, his physical hand. Yeah, I think he's a host. He cannot raise his Zoom hands. He has to raise. Yes, hand. exactly. Uh, that's really interesting. I was wondering about efficiency and does this kind of strategic game between states on burden sharing uh, reduce allocative efficiency in some way? Is there something you can say about that with your model? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, I, so, I, of course, yeah, it, it will reduce efficiency for sure. So um, the the states basically, so the the federal government is interested in like perfect efficiency, like overall welfare, but they have to play this game against the um, state governments who are also interested in overall efficiency, but they have these additional terms. So basically they behave a bit opportunistic against the decisions of the federal government. Um, it's a bit hard to compare, to directly compare the two policies. So this is also why in the empirical um, part, we have like, we kept it rather qualitative because the conditions are not, so if, if I just scroll up to to this one, like this condition is like really nice to handle. So because it's just the capacity shares, but I mean, we don't really know so much about the marginal benefits that we have. So, I mean, we know that the signs are like opposing, um, but it's it's a bit hard to quantify it. Okay, thank you, thank you, Paul. Uh, now uh, we will have a presentation by Lutz. Lutz, uh, you can share your screen uh, and yep. uh, you will present a paper about uh, uh, inequalities of uh, uh, carbon policies. And this is, uh, this is uh, of course, a very important uh, topic uh, because uh, uh, inequalities among countries uh, used uh, to be an argument during the World Summit uh, and uh, to oppose uh, any uh, uniform uh, policy. And, uh, and uh, inequalities uh, induced uh, in countries uh, are perhaps uh, uh, the main reason why it is very difficult to implement carbon policies uh, in a Develop, developed countries also. So, uh, Lutz, uh, you will have uh, 35 minutes uh, as uh, the previous ones. Uh, we, uh, the floor is yours uh, and uh, uh, we will uh, perhaps have questions. Thank you, Mireille, for, for this nice introduction and uh, for doing part of the motivation for me, which is really uh, helpful. Uh, 
I, I completely agree and I'm going to uh, say something similar uh, again in a second. Before I start, I just want to uh, thank Erie and the organizers and of course Mireille and the uh, committee for, for the award, which I'm really honored about. Uh, uh, I was glad to, to hear those news. Um, so I will present mostly one chapter of my dissertation, which is on the global consumer incidence of carbon pricing. Uh, but before I do that, I want to give you a quick overview of my entire dissertation. So I completed my uh, PhD last year at the London School of Economics. And uh, I, I want to thank also all my colleagues from, from the LSE who made my time there uh, really pleasant and, and fruitful. And especially, of course, my, my supervisors, Simon Dietz and Anthony Milner, who uh, supported me in, in many, many ways, uh, and who are partially responsible for, for this work as well. So my thesis overall was on the relationship between economic inequality and environmental or specifically climate policy. Um, and there were three chapters in there. The first one is the one I'm going to talk about uh, in a second on the global distributional effects between countries and within countries of carbon pricing policies. The second one uh, is a paper um, where I ask whether or not there's what I call an equity pollution dilemma. So if we progressively redistribute income from high income households to low income households, may that inadvertently raise the aggregate demand for CO2 emissions as embedded in uh, household expenditure decisions. Uh, and then the third paper is uh, a theoretical paper still somewhat in progress where I ask uh, whether or not societies that have higher degrees of inequality are also societies where consumers are more motivated by positional and status seeking consumption behavior. Um, but as I said, I, I want to focus uh, the rest of the talk on, on the first paper, which uh, was also my job market paper and probably the one I have most experience presenting. So in that paper, I ask globally when we have carbon pricing policies, uh, we may see uh, prices of goods rise and that will have welfare consequences. So what we call the use site incidence of carbon pricing. And I ask, how is that use site incidence distributed globally? Briefly as a motivation, uh, we, we all know that carbon pricing is one of the important policy tools being implemented by countries uh, and governments around the world. So just a quick statistic from the World Bank. In 2005, when the EU introduced uh, the ETS, first major carbon pricing scheme, uh, uh, some, some might argue, we jumped to about 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions being covered by a price mechanism. Uh, and today we stand approximately at about 16% of global greenhouse gas uh, emission coverage. And with China's uh, ETS, when it uh, goes online, we will surpass 20%. So carbon pricing is clearly one of the policy solutions that is being implemented all around the world, which uh, we as economists, of course, uh, uh, broadly welcome, but there are some nuances there. And it really matters uh, what may be the distributional effects and in particular, who might bear the cost of these policies. Uh, first of all, that can help us understand who might resist them. So I think all of you uh, remember the yellow vest protests uh, from France, uh, which were at least in part triggered by a perceived regressivity of a fuel tax reform, right? So uh, distributional effects and regressive effects uh, in particular, whether or not they're real or just perceived can be major roadblocks to, to climate policy. Uh, so it's important to understand them. And once we understand them, that can also help us uh, complement these policies and, for example, implement transfer schemes that uh, compensate those who bear the highest cost. So all this is known and there's a lot of work on that, but I want to argue in this paper that it can be interesting and worthwhile to also take a global perspective on this particular question. Uh, the first reason I think is that many countries are moving in broadly similar directions on implementing carbon pricing. We have some efforts on uh, multilateral coordination. And even if we don't have global coordination and policy, we always live in a globalized world, right? So goods are traded across borders, value chains are globally interconnected. So when China introduces 
a carbon price that may well have repercussions for American or European consumers who buy some of the goods imported from, from China. So I want to explicitly take this global perspective in, in this paper uh, and essentially ask what is the global distribution of the cost to consumers from higher prices when we have carbon pricing uh, and differentiate uh, or rather include in the model consumers in many countries and then in each country, of course, also at different income levels within them. Uh, and on top of that, uh, what I do is I add an, uh, a couple of what I consider important adjustment mechanisms. In particular, I let uh, producers substitute inputs across global value chains, right? So the idea is that if an American electronics manufacturer sees that Chinese metal goods become relatively more expensive compared to European metal goods, because Chinese metal goods have more coal in the value chain, then the American electronics manufacturer may change where they source their inputs from, and we may see a change in global value chain structures. Uh, and that's, I think, something important when we take a global perspective to take, to take on board. Uh, and what's nice is, uh, as I said, this differentiation, not only by goods, but also by countries of origin, allows me to estimate a number of policy uh, scenarios that I think previously were difficult to, uh, to look at the distributional effects for. Uh, how I do that is uh, I use a structural gravity approach, uh, which essentially uses data on aggregate bilateral trade flows between countries and sectors to estimate the parameters of my structural model. Uh, and once the model is parameterized, I can then plug in different scenarios. So at the moment, I have three policy scenarios that I work with. The first one is a global uniform carbon price. So all countries and all sectors, uh, what if they were to introduce the same price on emissions, if you will, the textbook first base, uh, first first best uh, policy solution in some sense. Uh, and I also think about what happens if we have carbon dividends to recycle the revenue uh, alongside those. Uh, it's maybe not the most realistic scenario anytime soon. So I also look at the actual introduction of the EU ETS in 2005. And then a third scenario, and that is really where my trade model can do something that I think some other models cannot really do. And that is, I look specifically at the distributional effects of trade specific policies. In particular, what if the European Union were to complement an EU carbon price with a border carbon adjustment, right? Which is essentially a carbon tariff to imported emissions and a rebate to emissions going out in order to uh, block a loss in competitiveness and in order to uh, uh, prevent carbon leakage. So that's something that's on the table very much and being discussed in policy uh, circles. So uh, that's something that uh, uh, I thought is, is uh, useful that I can do with this uh, model as well. And I uh, want to actually uh, show you a quick poll because I've modularized the model so that I can plug in different scenarios. So I want to ask you a poll question and see if you have additional ideas I have three options that I'm considering, and uh, there's also an other option, which you're, you're welcome to write something in the chat or send me an email. I'm, I'm always happy to, to hear ideas. Okay, uh, I will revisit the poll results in a minute, but let me continue for the time being. Uh, there's of course a large literature on distributional effects of climate policy and carbon pricing, uh, which many, many of you will, will know. Um, I would say that most of this literature focuses on individual countries and the question of is it high or low income Americans who are most affected by, say, the introduction of a carbon tax, uh, which in some sense is the natural starting point because as a national government that's mostly what you care about, your own constituency. Uh, but as I said, I think from a research perspective and potentially from a, a social planner concerned with the globe uh, perspective, we may also want to look at uh, the global distribution. Uh, in general, the findings are that uh, the incidence of carbon pricing is somewhat regressive, disproportionately burdening low-income consumers, uh, at least in rich countries like the United States. But there are important differences between countries, and I will find exactly the same in, in my 
results. And the results also uh, depend quite a bit on the modeling choices and methods used, and in particular on what we do with the revenue, right? And that's again something that uh, uh, I will see in, in my global analysis as well. Okay, so I said it already, the way I see my contribution here is to complement this literature and say, what if we explicitly take the perspective of a global income distribution that subsumes many countries and income levels within them? Uh, the method is a st structural gravity modeling approach, uh, which then uh, has numerical simulations akin to a, a computable uh, a model, but not, uh, not necessarily a, a CGE, computable general equilibrium model, um, but parts of what might go into such a model, the parts that I felt were most important. So on the demand side, the engine is really a global, almost ideal demand system, uh, which characterizes consumption in different countries and at different income levels, uh, which also allows consumers, of course, to substitute what they consume as relative prices change, and then to, for me to quantify the welfare effects that they experience. Uh, I don't simply translate the carbon uh, emissions content into price changes of goods, so this is not a, a fully static incidence uh, analysis. Instead, I introduce two what I think are important adjustment margins on the production side. Uh, uh, firstly, I allow for fuel substitution of the primary fuel input used in production. So most of that will be substituting away from coal and into natural gas or away from coal and gas into electricity and renewables. Uh, and then the second margin is intermediate input substitution, as I mentioned, where producers can source intermediates from different origins based on their relative price changes. And essentially I take the global value chain as is, as a starting point, and then simulate a new equilibrium input output structure of the world economy uh, after substitution has taken place. And all this somewhat dampens the price increase experienced by consumers. Both of those structural models are then parameterized using a gravity equation uh, estimation approach. Uh, for the demand system, I use trade, bilateral trade in final goods data. And for the um, production side, I use uh, bilateral trade in intermediate inputs. Okay, the data uh, primarily comes from the world input output database, which gives me uh, between country and industry trade flows in intermediates and final goods also gives me CO2 emissions accounts for, for those sectors. And that is complemented by the data necessary for the structural gravity estimation, uh, which is bilateral trade cost from SEPI, country population and income from Penn World Tables, uh, income Gini from the World Income Inequality Database and quality adjusted prices from Feenstra and Romales. Ultimately, I, I won't have time to go very much into detail on the gravity uh, estimation, but for those of you who, who know these methods and, and the literature, uh, on the demand side, I really follow quite closely this paper by Feigelbaum and Kandelwald, who exactly pair an almost ideal demand system with an arming trade system in order to estimate a global demand system from from trade data. Uh, and on the supply side, I use uh, an even simpler standard constant elasticity of substitution gravity framework following Anderson and Van Winkorp. And then I pair that with input output based emissions accounting a la Leon TF, as some of you may know from in particular industrial uh, in the industrial ecology literature. Uh, uh, quite a lot of assumptions go into those it's all those steps, uh, but luckily the estimates look very much in line with the previous literature uh, and they don't vary very much over years, which, which is uh, good because uh, results don't depend on the choice of year very much and uh, look very similar or all results replicate if I use a different data source instead of the WIOD, uh, an entirely different set of data uh, gives me more or less the same result. Okay, finally, I'm going to show you some 
results. But before I do so, I of course want to mention uh, some of the limitations here. So this is a large structural model and I'm trying to take the bird's eye view on uh, if you will, the global income distribution. So of course, many assumptions go into this and it's in no way a perfect model. Um, what I would argue is probably the strongest assumption is that I have to rely, rely on aggregate trade flows between countries and sectors in order to infer my model parameters and uh, the, in particular, the income elasticities of demand that then interpolate within country distributions, right? So. The key assumption is that if rich countries buy more American textiles and less Indian textiles, then American textiles are a luxury good and rich consumers or high income consumers will buy more American textiles and uh, less Indian textiles. So a very strong uh, assumption, which is necessary because I don't have a system of globally harmonized uh, consumer micro data that actually differentiates also by country of origin of all the different goods. Uh, I am though working on some cross validation using uh, consumer micro data for my 40 countries. And uh, I can show you later that at least for the US for now, it looks, it looks like my model does a reasonably good job at matching uh, the micro data. And of course, it's not a full general equilibrium analysis. So I'm capturing important margins of adjustment intermediate input substitution, fuel substitution, but I don't have a general equilibrium analysis which has, uh, for example, a price mechanism that adjusts imperfectly. Uh, so I assume perfect competition and constant returns to scale. So 100% of all the carbon prices passed on to consumers. There's no room for OPEC to get together and decide on uh, influencing the price for oil, for example. And I cannot at all capture uh, induced technological change, which carbon pricing may actually be uh, intended to, to spur. Uh, that's simply out, outside of the model. And then finally, for now, I focus on use side incidents due to higher prices. I don't very much look at changes in income and sectoral shifts in jobs, uh, but I'm currently working on implementing that a bit better because it is in the model because global value chains and sector allocations change. I just have to find a way to present that and link that back to, to the source site at the moment. Okay, uh, I will quickly share the results of the poll. Thank you very much for participating. Um, so some of you are interested in a border carbon adjustment for the United States, but the majority would actually like to see uh, a scenario about potentially linking the EU and Chinese uh, uh, emission trading system. Thanks, that's a really valuable input. So I will, I will think about if that's something I can, I can actually do. Okay, finally, let's uh, get to some of the results that I actually do have for you uh, right now. So I'm gonna show you the results of this first scenario. What if all countries implemented the same carbon price of $30 per ton of CO2 in all their industries? Uh, I go back and parameterize the model to 2004 before the EU ETS was introduced, but all of these results look very similar if I do, the, if I do this for uh, later years, like 2015, okay? So this is uh, what I get out, and this is the global consumer incidence of this uniform carbon price. So on the horizontal axis, you see the world income distribution over my 40 countries, which has about uh, 4.2 billion residents. Uh, and on the vertical axis, you see the net welfare effect on consumers where negative values are uh, losses or costs. Right, so here we see that consumers in the bottom 20% of the world income distribution experience a loss that's equivalent to taking away 1.7% of their total annual budget, while the loss to those in the top 20% of the world income distribution is only about half that. And we see a steep decline between the 60th and 80th percentile, which is why I call this uh, a regressive global uh, incidence in the sense that it's really the bottom half of the world income distribution that experiences the highest cost of, uh, of this carbon pricing scenario. But of course, this graph masks a lot of heterogeneity. So let's look at 
all of the individual countries here. So now each line is one country and on the horizontal axis is the country income distribution now. Uh, and we see on this graph that in rich countries such as Sweden at the top or the United States, we see the highest cost on the left of the graph. So in lowest income consumers experience the highest cost of carbon pricing. Carbon pricing is somewhat regressive in those countries. Uh, but in other countries like India and China, the curves actually slope down, which means that uh, in those countries, the incidence is somewhat progressive, a higher relative cost share to high income consumers. And that is something that we see in the individual country literature as well, this split between rich and poor countries, uh, moderate pro uh, regressivity and moderate progressivity. Uh, but I, I thought it's interesting that uh, we can put this side by side and look at all the countries at once. And on top of that, I would argue that the main insight from this graph is not really that, okay, some lines slope a little bit up, some slope a little bit down, but actually what matters the most is the distance between the lines, right? So it matters most if you are a Chinese consumer or a Swedish consumer, much more so than it matters if you are a high or a low income Chinese consumer. So the global incidence here is over 90% of that variation is explained by the country you live in. So the between country incidence dominates the within country income incidence. Uh, and a big chunk of that is because Chinese consumers consume mostly still Chinese goods, which have a lot of coal upstream in the value chain, while Swedish consumers uh, consume Swedish goods, which have renewables uh, and, and nuclear uh, up the value chain. Uh, and this difference between countries in emissions intensity of value chains is really what drives most of the global distributional effects of carbon pricing in this sense. And uh, I don't show it to you now, but the picture looks very much the same for the EU ETS. Again, a regressive impact of the EU ETS, and again, mostly driven by differences between countries, in particular, Eastern European and Baltic nations, where consumers are subject to more emissions intensive value chains and hence most affected compared to their other European peers from the EU ETS, uh, which I thought is an interesting uh, point that I haven't seen discussed as much as uh, uh, we may want to. So that is uh, the, the first insight, globally regressive carbon pricing driven mostly by differences between countries. Uh, and now what I want to add to that scenario is uh, carbon dividends. So the, the carbon pricing revenue that we collected, I now let countries redistribute that uh, revenue per capita lump sum as a carbon dividend. And then uh, the results change quite a lot. This is the individual country uh, net effect, including dividends. So in almost all countries, we now see strong progressivity and actually uh, positive net welfare effects uh, for the bottom half of the income distribution in all of those countries. And we see stronger progressivity in countries that are more unequal, where the mean consumer pays the tax and the median consumer may actually be below that and receive a, a lump sum a rebate. So we see that if you want to do a political economy analysis, in most countries, more than 50% of individuals are net benefactors from a carbon pricing plus dividend scheme, which I thought interesting. And now if we go back to the global distribution, we also get a progressive, strongly progressive global distributional effect, where really the bottom half of the world income distribution uh, uh, has a net positive welfare change or benefits net uh, after receiving the dividend payout. And I want to stress that one thing that's uh, interesting here is that the carbon dividends I allow for are at the national level. So China collects carbon pricing revenue and redistributes only to Chinese consumers. There are no between country transfers at all. And even without between country transfers, we achieve global progressivity of this uh, carbon pricing policy mix, uh, which I think is, uh, is potentially a really interesting finding when we think about international uh, economic negotiations on, on climate policy going forward. Okay, 
those were some two of the key key results I wanted to share. In the paper, of course, there's a lot more. Uh, in particular, I uh, promised you that I would show you some evidence that my model is not just making up data out of thin air. So when I compare my model here, the incidence in the United States of the first dollar of carbon pricing, that's the dashed line, uh, the, the solid line, compared to consumer expenditure survey microdata at the household level, uh, what is traditionally used in the individual country studies, uh, I see that at least in the United States, my model does a fairly good job at replicating the microdata. And I'm working on the other 39 countries, but you can imagine that that uh, takes a little bit of uh, of time to, to do. Uh, and as I said, uh, if I use Eora instead of WIOD as a completely different data source, uh, results look very much the same. So here you have my, uh, in blue, my WIOD results that I just showed you, the first graph. Uh, and the other graph is if I do the entire thing all over again, estimate all the parameters, use a different data set and simulate again uh, the scenario, I get something that looks very similar, which I thought was, was reassuring in that, in that sense. Okay, so uh, to conclude, uh, uh, I, I hope that this is uh, interesting, at least to some of you, uh, to see uh, how we might go about estimating a global distributional effect of, of climate policy, uh, where I try to capture in my model differences between countries and within countries at different income levels. Uh, also, uh, model substitution across global value chains and all that uh, using uh, a structural gravity trade uh, uh, approach. Thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent. Uh, so, uh, do we have uh, some questions from the audience? Me, Maurizio. Maurizio, yes, okay. Uh, thanks, Louis. It's a very interesting presentation. I am not an expert of uh, uh, your structural gravity model. So my question is more, uh, let's say, of general interest in my opinion, what actually caught my attention the, the most. Uh, so, um, so I understand on the, on the very last um, uh, slides that you have shown, I understand that the distribution effects of the dividends, when you have included the dividends, uh, across income distribution. And in particular, I have noticed a bump. Um, yes, exactly, that bump. So my question is just, uh, you know, very, very simple. Where do you think it comes from? So why? And if there is a, a country in particular which brings that, that result up and what are your explanations out of it? Yeah. Thank you, Maurizio. That's a great question. So uh, that bump is due to uh, the countries included in the WIOD. It's 40 countries. It's most of the EU member countries, but then it includes some of the very big developing countries like India, Indonesia, and China, which essentially make up the entire bottom 60% of the distribution here. Uh, and so that's, I think, the, the bump you see here is that really most of Europe happens in the 80th to 100th percentile uh, and then most of India and China is, is on the left and that's I think what has this uh, sort of bump. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? I would also have one if there's yes. nobody else. So maybe you can go back to this bump. Um, no, I realized like basically consumer gain is almost positive for everyone, but it's just from the the carbon price. You, do you um, include like climate damages, or is it really just um, the I don't know like re the redistribution and the dividends? Yeah, a very good question, and actually that's something that. Uh, I should probably have, have mentioned. So the overall sum of all these effects is negative. 
because there's an efficiency loss of having this price distortion, uh, even if you redistribute the revenue. Uh, but visually here, I think you have people on the right, which have some negative effects. And if you weight them by their income level, then the total sum is negative. Uh, but there's a lot of lot of low income individuals on the left who have positive effects. And that's, I think, why, why overall it looks almost like most of the world has a positive net effect when really if you weight it by income. Uh, so the number of individuals benefiting is larger than the number of individuals losing, but the overall net sum of effects is still negative because the losses are in the high income distribution end. Okay. I, I think it would be also really interesting. Um, I mean, it is really great what you did already, um, but also to add, if that's possible, um, also what like a comparison with the damages that people would um, suffer. So, I mean, this looks like hey, we can do this even without climate change. So it would be a good idea. But if we add, um, and I guess that also like the least income people would be more affected. And maybe this would also like make the bridge to like other literature, other climate literature that is like rather comparing costs and benefits and you're you know, basically just looking at this price without um, even considering the damages and even this is interesting and shows good results. Yeah, I think. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good, good point. I, I agree. The benefits will likely push all this upwards. Okay. Another question? If there's high, um, if there's very small time, I would like to ask one. Uh, I unfortunately joined a bit late. Um, uh, hi Lutz, also thank you for the great presentation. It's nice to see it presented. I guess I was wondering about your model, how difficult it would be in the gravity model to include efficiency um, gains, not just fuel switching or basically relaxing the assumption that um, sectoral inputs in terms of fuels will be reduced. Or are they in there? I don't think they are. So uh, I hope I understand your question right. So there are production functions and there's a, a substitution of inputs, including intermediates and primary fuels. So if you will, there is a, there is an efficiency loss from changing the production input uh, allocation relative to what you would have otherwise chosen as a, as a company. Uh, Mm -hmm. I have to think more about if that's something quantifiable or if, if you can separate the price effect and the efficiency effect. I'm not sure if, if you can only have one or the other, to be honest. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to uh, the three of you. And uh, thank you to the audience uh, for this uh, very uh, interesting session.